It's Comics Are Great, the visual storytelling show recorded live every other Wednesday at the Ann Arbor District Library in beautiful, gorgeous, sublime Ann Arbor, Michigan, comics.aadl.org. And this is the show where we talk about making comics, the lifestyle of a cartoonist, the lifestyle of comics writers, the thoughts and worries and fretting that goes into this medium that drives us mad. My name is Jersey Droz, cartoonist and teaching artist. And with me today, returning to the show, it's been a long time, Dan. It has been. It's been too long. Last time you were on Skype. Yes. And when we had Brian Drewhart on, uh -huh. and we talked about um, stories for girls, yeah? We talked about something. <laughs> But you were also on <laughs> episode one of the show because the name, this is, I'm, it's episode 79, so it's been a long time. Yes. Uh, you're, you're the uh, originator of the name of this show. Accidentally. Yes. Accidentally. And I, and, and I wonder if we could just quickly go into the story of that, just for the, the five-second version of the story. Sh sure. I, the short story is that you were on a panel at a, a comics event, and uh, one of your fellow panelists talked about how uh, she really wanted to make a movie. Yeah. But because that's so expensive, she did her story as a comic instead. <laughs> and it was all I could do not to rush the, <laughs> the podium and, and the shake table. her. You know, <laughs> and, and go all Hulk on her. But, <laughs> you know, I said to you afterward, how can you say that? If you want to do movies, do movies. And don't talk about it when you're, on a comics panel. You can do comics. You don't have to think about movies because comics are great. And the way you said it, like I watched you turn into, I mean, you're six foot three, six four. foot, six <laughs> foot four. Yeah. I saw you turn into an eight year old boy when you said that. You're like, I think comics are great. And I was comics like, are great. Yes. Man, that moment stuck in my head. So yeah, that was where I got the idea for the name of the show. So yes, Dan Michigan, co-creator of Blue Devil, Amethyst Princess of John World. You worked on Wonder Woman, Superman, um, Spell Game. Spell game was one of mine. Yeah, yeah, uh, with Ramon Perez, and yeah. then and then uh, the Forest King, a book that you wrote, book illustrated book illustrated by Tom Mandrake. Tom and I also did um, Creeps, Creeps, uh, horror miniseries at Image, and uh, just had a an online Batman story at uh, Legends of the Dark Knight. That's right, uh, Comicsology, right? Yeah, con Comicsology. It, it was quite cool. A story about. The, uh, the Catholic Church in Gotham City, as well as Two-Face. Mm -hmm. It was kind of interesting. People have commented that it wasn't about pedophile priests and corruption in the church. How could that be? <laughs> well, because actually my topic was more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and, and DanMichigan.com or Dan Michigan on Facebook, Twitter. Yep, uh, yep, that's Good me. branding. So, um, and co-organizer of the Kids Read Comics. Of Kids Festival. Read Comics, yes. And we'll talk about that later, you too. Bet. But uh, and then also you got some new stuff coming out that we can't talk about. Right, I have a, actually a big, interesting nonfiction project, yeah. comics project that's going to be coming out next year with my old uh, uh, amethyst collaborator Ernie Cologne. Oh my god! Uh, it's going to be very cool. So and, exciting! And you and I, I understand, are trying to sell an exciting girls' fantasy project. Hopefully, it'll happen. Yeah, with uh, with no curse words in it. No curse words, uh, and uh, I, I don't think that well, this is why it won't be at DC. Is I don't think that there's any kind of uh, you know like violence happening to women. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's, um... So we're doomed to fail. Right. You know, <laughs> fail oh, failed by some lights anyway. <laughs> So that polite laughter that we heard uh, in the background is a new guest to the show who I have been craving to get on the show for the longest time. I've been a big fan of your work for years and years. Dean Tripp of DeanTripp.com. Thanks uh, so much. Yeah, it's great to be here. Let's see. Dean Tripp of Butterfly, a webcomic right. that you do, uh, and Project Rooftop. Project Rooftop is uh, a website where you host and blog about superhero redesigns. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, I'm uh, crazy about redesigns of superheroes. And, uh, but it's not just you on there. It's like a bunch of people who are doing different character redesigns on there. Am I right? Well, we have a staff, uh, and then I co-founded the site with Chris Arendt, and uh, along with a bunch of other writers and former editors and former shop owners and stuff, uh, we kind of hold events that allow people to send uh, redesigns of superheroes to us. Ah, uh, okay, okay, and then um, we should also mention you uh, you do podcasting. You do the last cast with Scott Fogg. Uh, well, it's not technically me. It's the, <laughs> they've been broadcasting back from the future. Um, I find them fascinating, 
it's a little weird that I haven't learned anything at all or grown in my understanding of stuff. It just sounds like me talking now, to tell you the truth. <laughs> That's one of the things I love about this show is that you guys don't break the premise that it's the ghost of Dean Tripp and then a computer with, like, the memories of Scott Fogg. Is that what it is? Well, uh, accord- and this is, you know, I don't know. I just listen to the show <laughs> like you. Um, but it's... Uh, uh, a killing machine robot that aided in the destruction of humanity that I, you know, repurposed by, you know, putting all of his, uh, Scott Fogg, my buddy's blog posts and, uh, social media into, and it basically has his exact same personality. So it's, but I it, enjoy the show. I, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> it. It is a pretty fun show. And the latest episode, uh, was actually about, Hey, check this out. It was about amalgam comics, which I keep a copy oh, with me always. Funny. Of Thorian of the of the Asgods. Have you did you read the Amalgam comics? Oh yet? yeah, I I enjoyed the heck out of them. Yeah, exactly. they're the yeah. best. Yeah, you, there's there's a full like forty minutes or so on the latest uh, last cast with uh, which is uh, what is that? That's lastcast.tumblr.com. Am I right? Uh, I or last last cast po- podcast.tumblr.com. I think but I'm not a hundred percent. If you just search for the last cast on iTunes. Yep, there we go, and then you'll get to it. And then also we should say what Butterfly is about, too, because I, I kind of skimmed over that. Butterfly is a webcomic, a superhero webcomic. Yeah, that I you know haven't updated in a million years, but it's uh, I love it. It's just one of those things that you want to get back to. It's all I'd really like to work on, to tell you the truth. But it's, um, it's about a sidekick of a sidekick. So there's like a little eight-year-old superhero that tags along behind uh, the teen sidekick who tags along behind the Batman-type guy. And he's got the awesome domino mask, uh, like the cool version of the domino mask, which is like sort of halfway in between like uh, a Spider-Man eye and then like a, a, a Robin mask. You know why, right? It's, yeah, I do know uh, it's why. Like I listen to Boys from Amalgam Comics. Yeah, because ah. I listened to the to the last cast. That's how yeah. I and, and when, and eyes. when I heard your future ghost say that, uh, I it went back and was like, yeah, that is like Butterfly's mask. Holy cow! <laughs> Uh, yeah, I uh, I always that, that the Spider Boy costume just really stood out to me. It's gorgeous. Every all the amalgam characters are are just wonderful. But that's the book that I fell in love with, Mike Waringo, and uh, I'll love Spider Boy forever. <laughs> uh, so bad. which which was your favorite of the amalgam characters? You know, I can't even remember, but I have to go back and look at Spider Boy now because I, it, they need to revisit it so much. Because they had super soldiers, Captain America and uh, Superman, and then Dark Claw, who's Wolverine and Batman. At the time, I didn't like Wolverine that much because I was more of a DC guy, but now I, I love the idea of a Batman Wolverine. That's rad. Didn't Dave Gibbons do the Super Soldier one? That sounds right. I think right. he did the second one. Okay. okay. That's the one I got. And yeah, that, that, uh, Ca- the Captain America Superman mashup was so good. And Dean, your future ghost observations on that, that smushing together those cha- two characters was, I think, spot on. It was when you said uh, that Captain America is like the one Marvel character who feels like a DC character. Yeah, yeah. Because... Uh, the, the morality, and he's, he's got, like, an optimistic worldview, which doesn't feel right in the Marvel Universe. <laughs> I think Scott pointed that out, but it makes so much sense because Captain America actually was more of a... I mean, he's... Captain America is basically Superman's moral center with Batman's skill set, and he's created, you know, 20 years before the Marvel Universe. That's true. Yeah, a great character. One uh, Chicago con, I think it was, uh, my friend Dan Jurgens was at his... Uh, artist alley table and he was doing a commission for a fan i uh, did the three characters he was pretty much known for uh, right around then which was captain america superman uh and thor which he had which he had been doing and i looked at this picture that he's drawing and i said oh well gosh that's easy cap takes them both <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> you know and and i think dan's response was have you been talking to Mark Wade? <laughs> <laughs> but you know that's that's what Captain America does. He finds a way. And you know, on the subject of what superheroes do, yes. the best superheroes do is that they find a way. That's a really good description, I think, of what makes superheroes important. Uh, okay, well, let's dive you into can't that. Have okay. uh, like Superman needs to win in a Superman story, right? Mm-hmm. But. If you have him in a story with Captain America or Batman, because Superman's like an ideal being, right? He's like a godlike thing. And then Cap and Batman both represent uh, the 
best we could be. The best we could be has to be able to take out our gods. Right, right. Like thematically. What we can, that's why Batman always wins against Superman. Captain America would too. You're totally right. Yeah, yeah. There's no question. Uh, so that's where I want to start is that, you know, when you say, when people say superhero discussions, there's a lot of baggage that comes with that, you know? Like people are like, oh, I'm not going to listen to this one. This is about you know, superheroes. They're going to talk about what's Wonder Woman wearing this year, you know? Uh, <laughs> And I want to start with the... She's, she's wearing her invisible robot clothes. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, it's like, it's like the costume redesigns and continuity reboots and whatever. Like all of that like nerdy surface minutia that, that is fun to talk about, but mm, is it, I don't think is as interesting as like some of the deeper places you can go. And I think this is exemplified by that piece that you did, Dean, that sort of took over the internet a couple weeks ago. Uh, you'll be safe here which is a, a gigantic piece that you did. What would it take you? How many days did it take you to do this thing? It took me 13 days drawing for eight to 14 hours per day. I've never drawn anything that took that long at all. Like my style is really simple, sp specifically so that I can draw so quickly. Uh, Cause <laughs> I uh, have like a million other things going on. So when I sit down to draw, I want it to be really clean, but <clears throat> that piece, I, uh, I was like a madman on it. It was going to be like 30 or 40 characters, and it ended up being 116. I've got a list right here of the ones you missed, Dean, by the uh, way. I was going to say, I do too. <laughs> did you, you get any really good ones? No, I'm kidding. I just, I, at the moment I saw it, I was, I, my first thought was, I wonder how many emails Dean's going to get about, you forgot, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I'll tell you, the main one is uh, Deadpool. Who uh, it's called You'll Be Safe Here, not You'll Be Endangered Here. So that doesn't even make any sense. And uh, a lot of people want a lot of anti hero type guys. And it's nothing against them, but Rorschach and, uh, and Judge Dredd just didn't make it in, you know? Like, right. It's a, the drawing, by the way, is it's page 12 of a larger fan comic I've been working on this summer. Mm. And uh, it's, a, it's about my life growing up with Batman. And uh, if it was done, it'd be totally relevant to this discussion. But. Um, <laughs> Uh, that page is uh, is where uh, Batman is saving me when I'm six years old, like bringing me into the world of superheroes, and he says, you'll be safe here. Mm. And uh, there's a little me, stand, like grown-up me, behind Wolverine. Ah. But I, I was uh, – that drawing had to be, you know, perfect for the, the story. But then when I was done with it, I had to put it online because I thought it worked so well just as a single piece. And then Will Wheaton reblogged it, and it's been kind of madness since then. <laughs> wow, yeah. But what, what struck me about the piece when I saw it was, and I was actually reminded of you, Dan, because I was like, I'm looking at this, I'm like, this is a guy who's, and I, and I read your blog, I read the, your Tumblr, uh, Moonbase A, Moonbase A? Or it's deantrip.tumblr.com. Yeah, yeah deantrip. Um, and I read the posts that you do about Batman and about, you know, like, uh, you know, responding to issues of gun violence and what these heroes represent. And like, you know, Batman, I, it's like, I want to protect you, but I'm just a story. You have to protect yourself. All of these messages about, like, yeah. what Batman means to you. Um, and I, It's I, obviously I, my religion. <laughs> like, there's, there's no other way to put it. Actually, funny, funny side story. Uh, I, I was at the, the Toronto Comics Arts Festival, and Dave Roman was introducing me to somebody. And Dave said, introduced me as, like, this guy really, really loves He-Man. Like, he's playing <laughs> me. And, and, I, and, like, and like the, the person I'm introduced to says, like, oh, to the point where you say, what would He-Man do whenever you're making a decision? And I'm like, well, yeah. And then Dave, like, Dave grabs his arm and goes, yeah, yeah, he really does do that. And I said, <laughs> Yeah, I'm. I'm. That's sometimes great. I feel like I'm almost as weird as Dean Tripp is about Batman, and everybody was like, "No, nobody's that." <laughs> so anyway, yes, yes. This is a guy who loves Batman a lot, but not just because it's like, oh, he's got pouches and he's got the Bat Mouse compartment that he can put Zan and Jaina into or anything like that. Uh, it's it's like what the character means and like what the the that poster I think that I was so stricken by was this sense that superheroes are characters who protect children not just in the terms yeah. of the story, but in terms of their function in literature. Am I wrong? Oh no, I don't I don't think you're wrong. I think that superheroes end up creating a foundation for a life well lived. You know, uh, that's that's protection right there. If you assume that living a good life is good for you as a person, 
(laughs) (laughs) Which, you know, I know people argue with that premise. But I think that that's what superheroes are doing for young people who are reading about them. They're not... It's always... Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, They're not swooping in to save you. They're giving you, like, your, you know, you have to save yourself message. Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, like, I definitely like the idea of, uh, of superheroes because they will come save you if they've got to. But here in the real world, you end up feeling like, as a Batman fan, very uh, Dick Grayson-y, very Tim Drake, you know, where it's, I found my way into the Batcave and I figured out who Batman is and I know, I now have the tools I need to accomplish things in life. And I know, because I'm not really, it sounds crazy, but I, you know, Batman punching people isn't what I like about him. Mm-hmm. I like that he's a guy who's dedicated his entire life to helping people. And so when people talk about like child endangerment with Robin or something like that's not it. It's a metaphor for like the tools you need to live and care for others. And you know, what's funny. I was saying this thing for years, like Batman uh, teaches you to use all of your abilities to help everyone you can. Mm -hmm. That's been, that's what I think superheroes are, right? Grant Morrison, like two years ago, put that in an actual comic book, this thing I've been saying and like just to people like it's not like he heard it from me, but I was like, we are on the same wavelength. Like Talia al Ghul was hassling Dick Grayson about his relationship with Batman. He's like, I was raised by a man to use all of my abilities to help everyone that you can. I was like, that, that's a thing. That's the thing I said. <laughs> you know, my it's sense text of now. Yeah. My sense of Dick Grayson. Again, not the child endangerment. It's right. that Batman prevented saved Dick Grayson from becoming what Bruce Wayne had to become. He solved yeah. his parents' murder. He brought justice. He kept Dick from being a, a, a crazy, driven, guilt-ridden, which I think guilt is actually probably the motivating fact. My version of Batman contains the idea that he's driven most by guilt over not having been able to prevent his parents' death. I, mean, that's, I, I think that's maybe a minority position. Mm. I don't think that's a bad point of view, though, because that's a thing children do, and right. Batman's essentially an eight-year-old trying to save right. the world. Yeah. You know, that's any childhood, child who goes through a trauma, they blame themselves forever, you know. Right, and that's my sense of it, and he, he saves Dick from that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Dick Grayson's Batman with the benefit of having a Batman. Right, right, exactly. Interesting. Uh, already, you guys are going into areas that I, I wow. Uh, this idea that that superheroes are supposed to be real, guys. Superheroes are supposed to be real. They're supposed to feel like real guys. I mean, the great thing about Marvel is Spider, and this is something that people say: Spider Man could be the guy on the bus next to me. And if you, yeah. if you, yeah, like, and you, there's such a thing as radioactive spiders. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, my response in Jersey has heard this. Um, my response to this realism in comics uh, goes back to a miniseries that Marvel published probably 10 or 15 years ago now, all about how if the Hulk was real, there'd be, there'd be I know what you're thousands about. and thousands and thousands of people dead. And the only <laughs> interaction that official, the official world would have with the Hulk is trying to kill him and kill him dead forever. That sounds good. That's such an uninteresting story. <laughs> <laughs> the interesting story is the story in which we pretend that he doesn't kill thousands and thousands and thousands right. of people. So that we can think about what it's like to be Bruce Banner. Mm-hmm. What it's like to be the guy who, who has this monster inside him and wants to be wants to be a real person he's real in the emotional sense that's of course my other my other thing about realism the realism that counts is the real emotional core of the characters that you're talking about not the number of dead right Mm -hmm. no you can't enjoy a hulk story at all if you think he's killed anybody there's no reason to have like the idea that hulk turns into a monster is like he turns into a giant way too powerful thing that knocks over buildings Mm mm-hmm but they, I mean, it's been in the text several times. A lot of writers agree with both of us, I guess, that they've said that Hulk's never killed anybody. But then you get a different writer on who thinks, oh, yeah, he's just murdered thousands. And it, 
you can't have the dude show up in the Avengers movie if he's murdered thousands of people. So maybe let's not do that story. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You know what's amazing is kids totally get this. I work with kids all the time. I teach comics classes. I teach an ongoing eight-week recurring series at the Ann Arbor Art Center. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about superheroes one week, and I brought up the fact of, like, why does Batman do what he wants, what he does? What, what, what's his reason? What's his motive? And one kid raises his hand and says, oh, vengeance. Vengeance for his parents' deaths. And all the kids shouted him down. Like, no, it's not vengeance. Like, vengeance is bad. It's He's avenging. He's preventing that from happening to anybody else. He's protecting the world from his situation. Right. And You just made my heart grow two sizes too big. <laughs> and, and, like, half the class was kids girls. Kids get that. Yeah, kids totally get it. They, they understand this intuitively. And, uh, and it's weird when adults come in and go... And, I, and this is one I've told a million times. Like, you think you know Batman? You don't know my Batman. My Batman, he takes those little, those pointy things on his gloves and he slices people in the throat with it, you know, because that's what <laughs> we've been waiting for. So let's talk yeah, about, let's talk about the term breaking the toys. They just want to be a madman like all the other <laughs> criminals in Gotham. It doesn't make any sense. Like, what's the point of that story, you know? Right. And, you know, when we talked about the, the, the pretense that, that the Hulk has never, uh, has never killed anybody. The pretense with Batman is that he's never made a mistake. You've said something to this yeah. effect. Like, if Batman ever made a mistake... He would have to be hunted down. Yeah, why? <laughs> because, because he's a dangerous vigilante. By right. never making a mistake, he's not a dangerous vigilante. Uh, and that's, and, and it's, it's a little story we tell ourselves to tell, in order to tell the story that matters. <laughs> right. You know right. The thing I like about it, on top, I totally agree with you. Another thing I like about it is the dimension that's included that he works with one good cop. Right. Like, in, in a lot of children's stuff, all the cops are good guys. And uh, in a lot of adult stuff, all the cops are bad guys, mm -hmm. you know? But in, in this story, the police force is mostly good, but it has a corrupt element to it. And then there's one guy Batman has chosen as an ally, and that ally also validates what batman's doing by being his ally by ex putting you know the signal on top of the you know gcpd commissioner gordon's endorsing what he's doing so it creates this dynamic where it's like okay we're on the edge right now whether this is okay but it is that thing you were talking about vengeance though uh i uh i have a problem with writers who like the idea that joe chill was never caught you know <laughs> like well, if Batman caught his parents' killer, he'd stop. That makes no sense to me. It's not about his... He can't save his parents. He's not an idiot. He's saving everybody else's parents. He's saving everybody else's childhoods, right. you know? So you're talking about... I mean, I wonder if you guys can respond to this. This is a fight I get into with other cartoonists sometimes, is that I made the case that superhero comics specifically... I think all comics to a degree, but superhero comics specifically operate like poetry. And when you say to somebody, and I'm, I'm borrowing words from Joseph Campbell here, if you say to, uh, to somebody that you love, you're like, you're a rose, you're a swan, she'll say, make up your mind, right? And that's not, I'm not really saying you're a rose or a swan, right? I'm being metaphoric, I'm being poetic, I'm using ideas to generate, to, to capture this feeling that's so big I can't sum it up in, you know, uh, any kind of like didactic speech. Right. Do superheroes operate that way? Do, what do you guys think? Like in, in like like poetry, like like metaphors and and symbolism and similes. Well, I mean, they aren't about what's literally going on. Some of what's literally going on is is fun and clever and cathartic in the, you know, scary things happen and you get out of it sense. But in the non literal sense, they're doing things like what Dean is talking about. They're they're giving you the tools to save yourself. They're, the, stories, the stories are about finding your way through. In my version, those stories are about what you're going to do when you have adult power in the world. Mm -hmm. so that's sort of my, my brief description Blue of Blue Devil is a good example of that thesis, right? Because, I mean, here's a guy, normal guy, brilliant guy, but kind of carefree, finds himself trapped in this mechanical suit that gives him super strength and superpowers of all sorts. 
And now he's thrusted into the world where I'm on the JLA satellite. I'm arm wrestling with Superman, right? I'm fighting Metallo. Yesterday, I was a stunt man. That's right. That's right. Yeah, and you know, Blue Devil very much came out of uh, the, the fascination that Gary Cohn and I have with um, really the Flash stories from the Silver Age from when we were growing up. One of the things that's really interesting about those characters, and this comes across, I think, in Blue Devil, we use the trickster yeah. a lot in Blue Devil, is that these guys, they could all have gone to the other side of the law, all the rogues, right? Mm -hmm. It was a close thing. In, in the DC comics of that time, whether you were a good guy or a bad guy wasn't predetermined. Uh, sometimes it was you know, schematically laid out and a bad storytelling. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but there's a sense that once you gain power, there's a choice that you have right. to make. And, by the way, you have to make the choice every day. You, you don't stop making the, the, oh the choice. Gosh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all it is. That's the only line between heroes and villains, because every origin story could go either way. Right, right. And so, so when you then make that a metaphor and you say, okay, you're 10 years old, 12 years old, whatever, and you have a sense now that you're going to be an adult. You're going to get to do the things that adults do. You're going to have that power. Now, you probably overestimate the real power that adults have. That <laughs> well, yeah, that's right. Because like you look around at them and like every choice they make is the right choice. Dad knows everything, right? right. Like, Dad knows who to vote for every year. That's amazing. How does he do it? That's right. And can influence events. Yeah. You know, so maybe we've discovered now in adulthood we can't influence as many events as we thought we might be able to. <laughs> but when you're a kid and you're imagining power, that superhero story ends up being a pretty good metaphor for what you're imagining are going to be I the think choices. you're right. And I think, uh, though, that my sense of it, and I've, I've talked about this a lot, uh, but the, the power we have is just incredible. We don't think about it because of what you're saying. Like, we can't influence who the president is that much. We can't influence whether corporations are actually in control of things. And we can't save people on the other side of the world with our sheer will the way Superman could. But in our lives, we have so much power when we interact with others. Right. You know, there are people who you know, I'm sure, went into comics or went into like a certain field because of knowing you. Isn't that crazy? Like, I know people who are in this business just because we had a good talk at a convention 10 years ago. And uh -huh. that whether you choose to use your time as a force for good and encouragement or to like set yourself higher, like it really is, you're choosing to be Lex Luthor or Superman every day. Right, right. You, abs you absolutely are. You know, one of the things that we talk about with our Kids Read Comics events uh, that Jersey and I are, are part of, and we try to impress on the, the guests who are showing up or at their tables at, at Artist Alley that at any moment, you might be the person who changes some kid's life. Oh, yeah. You know? Yep. And that's happened, yeah, right? There's that story. There's, there's, there's an audio boo that I'll have to look up and put in the show notes where Ryan Estrada of RyanEstrada.com said that it was one of the best weekends of his life because he had that moment where that seven-year-old girl came up to him with finished mini comics and character charts, like right. charts of like, here's how each character feels about one another. And she said to him, what do I need to do to be a pro? And Ryan, bless him had the presence of mind to say, you are a pro. You're doing the exact same thing everybody here that's doing. And it's like, you just, you get behind that table. That's the only difference. That's yeah. it. That's it. That's the thing Brian Stelfreeze told me like 15 years ago. I was at a panel listening to him talk about comics. And he said, uh, if you want to do this, just do it. Because the only difference between you and me is I'm on this side of the table. As soon as you make a comic, you can sit down right next to me. Yeah, right. and, and and having like what you're talking about, Dean, and this is where I my I'm gonna make a I'm gonna make a statement. I'm gonna make a, a contention, and and I I don't even think that this is disputable. Uh, it's not weird how you feel about Matt Man, Dean, because I think that having that sense of what these characters represent and in providing you with this sort of a scaffolding of every day I got a choice between good and bad, right? right. Uh, a wholesome choice or a less wholesome choice. We don't have to say good and bad if you don't want to be that that uh, you know binary well, about it. It right? seems to me that it's it's selfish versus uh, you know helping others. Like there's, 
And you have to do some of both. It's not like Bruce Wayne doesn't have a really rad hangout, you know what I mean? <laughs> right. But, and the coolest gear entirely. Um, that's why I have an iPhone 5. That's why I have an iPhone 5. So, um, but you do, like, you have to choose, like, does it matter more to me that I'm, you know, minusculely successful more than I would be if I helped this person? Do you know what I mean? Mm. There's using others to get ahead, and then there's just doing what you think you would want someone to do for you. And it's not, but yeah, the, the reason why I like Batman and it's the, the story I'm working on is I had a pretty significant childhood drama. And uh, when something really heavy happens to you when you're a kid, there's this darkness that creeps in because, you know, your childhood life is that the world is pretty okay. But when something horrible happens and you go back to school and, and there's all these kids you know, six and seven years old who think the world's okay and you know it's not. Right. It's, there's this isolation that creeps in. And then when I was uh, about 10 or 11, the last week of uh, fifth grade, uh, our teachers let us watch the 1989 Batman movie. And look, I'd been a Batman fan as much as anybody as a kid. I loved the Adam West show, like to bits, just the colors and the costumes. If, I mean, if you see my stuff, they're bright and shiny because, you know, they should be wearing sequins and stuff. But um, <laughs> that 1989 Batman movie was the first time I understood his origin, you know, when Vicki Vale figures it all out. And I was like, oh, my God, it's about this kid whose world's broken. And rather than letting that corrupt him, he uses it to forge a way to help others. And that is the single greatest story I've ever heard. So that's why I've spent my whole life hung up on Batman. Right. And I'm, I'm, I think I'm hung up on Superman for reasons that are, you know, not entirely dissimilar. You know, I would, I would say that I'm here for a reason. And I right. don't know whose reason. I don't know what the reason is, but it's not to win football games. You know? <laughs> and, 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 and I knew that even before that great scene in, in the first Christopher Reeve Superman movie. The other really important thing about that scene is it immediately precedes his father's death. Yeah. Um, and, and a key to Superman, to me, is that he actually can't do everything. He seems to everyone like he can do everything. But he, every time, I just reread uh, Grant Morrison and Frank Whiteley's um, All Star Superman. And I, That's my favorite comic book of all time. Oh, man. Way. Every time Pa Kent dies, I just yeah. go to pieces. You know, every telling of that story. I use that story in uh, DC Comics Presents number 50, where we did a team up of Superman and Clark Kent. Of course, we had to split them, you know, yeah. in, in order to team them up. But, but the, the trigger for Superman to realize that he's not a whole person, that there's another part of him, was the memory of his parents' death. Uh, which in the comics of the time, it was, you know, both parents died of a disease and he couldn't, at the same time, couldn't prevent it. And the recognition of his limits is, is key to, you know, kind of understanding, to getting to the place where he understands the reason for his presence on Earth. Is, is, uh, it sounds like the reasons you guys like these two characters is that there's like a sort of like a, an underlying theme to the characters. And I think a lot of people talk about this, like, like Superman represents hope. Batman represents, Oh, I forget what word they, people usually ascribe to him. Um, what would it be Dean? Like if, if, if Superman's hope, Batman's what justice. I think, I think Batman's hope also. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's, no, he, I, I he, guess, he offers uh, the salvation that he I can't get himself. There's someone who will help you. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. But okay. But, but like, do all of the really good superhero characters have some kind of like one sentence thematic idea behind them? I, I think to be a good character. To be a good character. To, not be, just to be good any character, you, you have to have it. You have to have a reason for, for being. You have, there has to be something about your makeup as a character that causes readers to want to continue following your story. Mm -hmm. So they, it has to be at that level. I think su Superman's mostly trying to process how incredibly powerful he is by making himself the most useful being on the planet. And Batman is trying to process how many things he couldn't do by becoming the same thing. Like he's spent 
Like, he's on Superman's right. level as far as capability, which is why he usually wins in a fight. Mm -hmm. And as a guy, a kid who grew up on a farm and was adopted, I, I totally dig Superman, too. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I think they're, Batman has more of the weight of, you know, there is so much to do and I'm just a man. Whereas Superman is, I'm so powerful, what, what do I even do with this and not become horrible? You know? Well, yeah, there's also, I got to say, the, the previous Superman movie, Superman Returns, which was widely panned and was very problematic in my opinion, had yeah. one really wonderful key exchange that the movie would have been improved by if it had been brought up thematically, brought louder thematically, is when, you know, Lois Lane says, we don't need a savior. And, right. And he says... I hear people crying out to be saved every day. Yeah. And, and he means, he hears everybody mm -hmm. in, who needs some salvation crying out to be saved because he's got, he's got the ears to hear it. You mm -hmm. know? Yeah, I liked that movie more than most, I think. Yeah, me and too. I'm kind of a soft touch on just superheroes flying around makes me happy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and Butterfly is also Superman and Lois Lane's kid. So when they did that in that movie, I was like, it's, it's Butterfly's in the movie. <laughs> You know. Yeah. So the real question is why they didn't keep going with the Chris Nolan films and have him become, you know, uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt's sidekick. But well, um, yeah. yeah, that movie uh, had uh, some problems, and it's like that idea of like I hear people crying out for someone to save me all the time uh, makes so much sense. But then in the story, it's like I got to go stop these guys robbing a bank. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, the, the the problem. The problem of, of Superman's vast power is a, is a really big storytelling problem. I used to joke when I was doing a bunch of Superman comics for Julie Schwartz in, those team up, in that team-up book that the difficulty in a Superman comic is figuring out how it doesn't end on page two, you know, because, <laughs> because he's just too powerful. So you right. really do have to create a different kind of challenge for him than a physical one. Well, that's what makes it good. Yeah. It's like a lot of people want to, in their, you know, reboots of Superman, they want to depower him. Yeah. And I, uh, one of the things I love about All-Star Superman is it instantly powers him up. It's like, oh, I've got new powers. I've got a yeah. telekinetic, yeah. In, you know, invulnerability, and I can throw lightning punches, mm -hmm. you know. And then what do you throw at him? Like, you make him super powerful, and then as a writing challenge, you have to come up with something to throw at him, and it's impossible, and you do it anyway. And that, like, that challenge is what makes Superman stories so good. Right. It definitely does. Uh, so, Dean, you said something that I thought was really great. Superheroes flying around makes me happy. Yeah. Greg Schiegel of the Stuff Said Show, Stuff, Stuff Said, okay. Stuff Said Show, uh, dot com, is in the chat, and he says, "Is there a point where we overthink superheroes, talking of metaphors and poetry and meaning beyond the hero villain plots? Does it overpower the simplicity of what initially drew us to superheroes as children?" No, no, no. That that's. That's not overthinking. That's just discovering and talking about some of the stuff that's already there. Uh -huh. You know, I think that we're just giving voice to, um, to some interest, interesting thoughts, thoughts that should be interesting to people who want to have this kind of conversation, who want to <laughs> wanna, wanna understand their own responses to superheroes. Yeah. Well, and, and I, I think they're strong enough to take it, to tell you the truth. I don't know if uh, Bill Finger who, by the way, anyone listening doesn't know who Bill Finger is. He co-created Batman. He's my personal hero, and I'm probably on the same career tra trajectory, so uh, <laughs> I just look up to him a lot. Um, but Bill Finger, uh, I don't know if he had figured it all out. Like, he didn't, I don't know if he understood that this is why Batman's doing this. I think that was part of his character. And like all writers, you kind of can't create things outside of your own personal context, like your influences and your life story. And those things synthesize together into what you think is an original story, but actually you're drawing. Like Butterfly has all this baggage from my life in sure. it. And it's in the background, but it's like he's got a, a dad who left and he's being raised by his mom in the suburbs. And it's like, oh, yeah, I didn't realize I was just drawing me, you know. Uh, it was years later. But I think... Uh, when you go back and analyze superheroes, um, I mean, they're really the most successful fictional characters of all time and possibly the most successful idea of the 20th century. Like, there have been more t stories told about Batman and Superman than any other characters ever. 
right. because they cross all media boundaries and comics came out once a week. And we are at this point now of thousands and thousands of stories about these guys. Why is that? Why are we so drawn to these guys in tights with capes? <laughs> yeah, I think because they speak about these very important things, even if we don't consciously realize that that's what's going on. And, and you know, when you talk about uh, talk about finding all sorts of pieces of yourself in the stories that, that you tell. You know, my hope when I'm telling a story is that it takes me a while to realize that I'm writing about myself and I'm writing about issues that are important to me because I don't want that to gum up the works, you know? I don't want to trip over the fact that, oh, I'm writing a story about how I felt this way when I was 10 years old. <laughs> I like to find out along the way that I've kind of been doing that so I can use that judiciously in my storytelling. And that's great. I love when that happens, when I discover the part of myself that I'm talking about. So I can, yeah. I can be thoughtful about what I'm writing. That's always an embarrassing moment for me. Oh, it's terribly embarrassing. <laughs> it was very embarrassing when I sat and watched my mother read a, a short, uh, that short illustrated novel, The Forest King, yeah. uh, where she's just making these faces and she <laughs> comments on these scenes. And I go, uh, yeah, I guess that's uh, that's me too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I have it's the same moments. For me, with I'm now idea. working on this autobiography, autobiographical story. It's it's uh, it's only like 20 pages long, and um, you know, but it's it's the most personal thing I've ever done, and it's it's you know me and Batman, right? Yeah. And it's kind of like the footprints poem, but with Batman instead of Jesus. Oh, you know? right, right. <laughs> like Batman was carrying you mm -hmm. when there was only one line of grappling hook. Rope, you know? um, and, and it's funny because it's it's putting it's making all these things like you were saying like normally you don't want to touch on how specific these influences are but I'm now telling the exact story but what's funny is I'm having the same feeling that I do when I find one of these other stories because mm -hmm. I did not realize I was modeling my life on Batman so hard until about a year ago like anyone who knew me would tell you that Mm -hmm. But I didn't see it because there were other things. You know, I liked Superman and Spider-Man and Star Trek and the X-Men. And, you know, Batman was the first superhero for me, but he wasn't the only one. Right. And he wasn't the only type of story I liked. I love Starfleet, for example, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I spent most of yesterday wasting my time researching getting one of the new uniforms. But <laughs> um, about a year ago, it hit me. Uh, about I think it was about two years ago, but it, it dawned on me that it's like, oh, it's childhood trauma plus deciding to help others it's mm -hmm. that's that's been the whole thing for me and so now putting it in story form it's really uh, it's kind of raising my game to tell you the truth i think the pages i'm working on are the best thing i've ever drawn well i to cap this because we gotta get the book recommendations in a second believe it or not we've already blasted through an hour oh, see well, i told you it was gonna go fast man the good ones always go really really fast but we do this all day man I know, me too. All right, I'll, I'll call you when I get back home after this. Uh, awesome. But no, to cap this thing, it's like one of the the guiding or unifying principles between the two of you guys, as somebody who's been following your work, Dean, and somebody who's known you for a long time, Dan, is sincerity, honesty with your biography and being fearless in approaching that biography and then parsing it and, and chewing on it and then letting it find its way into your work, not forcing it in, not like, right. oh, here's my pain, everybody. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> here's a card. It's got my pain on it. Uh, but but the thing that, like, and, and I, this is what I was so stricken by when I saw that you'll be safe here piece, Dean. I was like, was like, this is a guy who, when he says it, he means it. You know, that, that's, that's uncommon currency on the Internet in particular, is to say it and actually mean what you're saying. Um, and I remember a piece that you wrote, that you posted on your Tumblr a while back. It was of Batman. It was talking about the shield on his chest. And I think it was in response to uh, gun violence. It was saying, you, you, t you take me on first, jerks I with guns. I think actually it was an anti-bullying thing. Oh, okay. People That's were talking, they were talking, I think, about the Chick-fil-A boycott okay mm -hmm. and you know that's a issue you know uh but just the point i was making is that anytime someone picks on one group even if you're not in the group batman's wearing a yellow target on his chest yeah. and stands in front of anyone who's being bullied yeah you know right you can't just like walk by you can't laugh at those jokes like and that's not being a killjoy and stuff but like you there's this uh uh improv idea called yes and you guys yeah. know what i'm talking yeah. about yeah yeah like when you're improving a scene 
what and I think a lot of people do in their lives is when people make horribly offensive, sexist or racist or homophobic jokes, they just kind of yes and it to get past it. Right. You don't need to do that. That kind of stuff's making the world worse. I don't know. Any yeah. kind of anti-bullying thing, I'm going to jump in on it because I, <laughs> I, I was bullied a little bit, but more than anything, it's like, you know, when people call, uh, you know, make uh, pick on uh, gay kids, it's like, I'm not gay, but I was called those same names. Oh, yeah. Being yeah. an artist kid who liked to spike his hair, you know, and wore glasses and or, uh, or well on tests. Or in my case, I collected strawberry shortcakes in first grade. There strawberry you shortcake go. dolls, you know. For and, real, that's awesome. And and, and my dad, my dad took me aside and he said, because I want to get a show and tell. My dad said, now kids are gonna say weird things to you that you may not understand. He's like, but when they say that, just respond with, I don't believe in stereotyping. Now I didn't know what that I'm meant. <laughs> right now, that's the best. And and I went to school and I was like, I don't believe in stereotyping. That didn't stop the name calling and the pushing and shoving. Uh, but but it it was. But uh, this is why we're friends right here. Right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I wanted My Little Ponies when I was a kid, but when they came out with the ones with the dragonfly wings, I don't oh, even remember yeah. what they were called. But now, you know, MLP is kind of a big deal, and I, I'm not a fan of the brony label because it's there's too many people in that group to want to be a part of a group <laughs> that I don't know everybody in. Right. But uh, my son and I love that show, and I'm thrilled to buy him toys of the stories about these awesome characters. Do you know what I mean? Oh, totally. Yeah, about, totally. I mean, a bit. My, his favorite color is pink. And uh, he's about to start school this fall, and I know people are going to hassle him for it, but there's no reason not to like pink. You know, 100 years ago, pink was the color for boys, and light blue was the color for girls. Mm -hmm. Dude's born a century late, and he gets picked on? It makes no sense. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I wanted to cap this thing by saying that I'm sitting in a room, virtually speaking, with two of the most sincere guys in comics. And ser seriously, I think that you guys, more people should be looking to you as, as a modeling exercise of how to approach writing and how to approach presence. But, you know, if, if, you, if you run away from the real that's inside you when you're telling a story so that you can do something that's clever but superficial, mm -hmm. uh, maybe impressive in various ways, you're, you're, you're so missing an opportunity and yeah. really missing kind of what you're supposed to be doing. Yeah. You know? You're supposed to be real. Batman isn't glib, right? Right. right. <laughs> like Batman, he does, he does not say anything that is like uh, ironic or insincere, right? Right. And when Superman says he will never lie to you, yeah, he, he, he means he will never lie to you. He'll yeah. try to try to keep that whole Clark Kent thing a secret, but you know, but he'll he'll find creative solutions right, to yeah, that problem right, too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, heroes, the superheroes find a way. They find a way. Yeah. Oh, we got the title for the show. Oh, man. <laughs> All right. So we got to do book recommendations. I've got a librarian. Erin Helmrich is in the building, and she's ready to come in here and recommend some books to us. So, um, Dan, based on our discussion today, what would be a definitive superhero story to go read? Well, you know, I would, I would go back to, um, to old stories, the stories I read when I was five years old, just because they're so meaningful for me, about a year ago, I found online um, the full story, uh, uh, Superman's Return to Krypton, which, boy, is so emotionally rich. Um, the story about Superman going back through time and through space, I don't remember how the heck it happened. <laughs> but he, he goes back, he finds himself on Krypton, a, a grown man interacting with his parents, who have not yet had him as a baby. Um, falling in love with a with a Kryptonian movie star, and oh, is it goofy? You know, all these stories were very goofy, uh, but it was sincere. It yeah. was all about that loss, you know, that that terrible, terrible missing part. And if that's you know, as my friend Danny Fingeroth has pointed out, if that's partly about the uh, the Jewish experience of mm. of you know leaving behind and an immigrant experience in general um then it, you know it's pretty and jerry siegel wrote that story so it, oh. it's uh and wayne boring who whose work i love on superman wayne yeah. boring is my favorite uh, silver age artist entirely that guy's a genius and he gets overshadowed by kurt swan because kurt swan's brilliant also yeah wayne boring man Clean. no wayne, i love wayne boring now i got to work with kurt swan which is great and i'm here to tell you no inker 
even Murphy Anderson has ever done Kurt Swan's pencils justice because I've seen you keep saying that and yeah, I feel a I've pang seen, it's like a knife yeah. in my heart every time because you really, get to see it and I didn't yeah yeah it's it's just it's just wonderful wonderful but Superman's return to Krypton you know, maybe Jersey and I will come up with the link and be able to show oh sure it on sure. the show page um, so yeah that as a, a recent story we're talking about uh, you know comics and kids and superhero comics and kids I loved a series that DC put out uh, called Supergirl Cosmic Adventures in the eighth grade. Yeah, a uh, great, great story. Uh, that Three Walker uh, and Eric Jones, man, right, that, that's that book right. was great. Yeah, re rethinks, reimagines Supergirl, uses you know the basic elements, but tells it afresh. It's a really, really terrific story. So I'd recommend that, and that relatively easy to find. I just want to mention, since you talked about Bill Finger, this is not a comic, but um, the, a book was recently uh, published about uh, by um, written by Mark Tyler Nobleman, mm -hmm. uh, it called uh, Bill the Boy Wonder about Bill Finger's role in the creation of Batman. And it's, uh, and it's a book for young readers, so it's, uh, it's well worth people's time. Mm. Yeah, I haven't read it yet, but it's on my to-do list. Mm -hmm. I'm so excited for that book. Yeah, it's cool. Actually, uh, uh, Tom in the chat is already grabbing links for all the stuff that we're talking about. So the Superman Return to Krypton has been posted as a link. And also in the chat, Shadowing Tronics said that uh, DC Comics Presents number 50 is one of my favorite Superman stories. Wrote a review of it recently, and he wrote a review. Wow, that's just lovely to hear. I'm, so I'm I will have to look at that review. I will, I'll send you the link for that. Okay, great. Um, so any other ones that you want to point out? I mean, Silver Age comics are the best. I mean, I, I, this is something I like to tell all the time. Is that, that was my introduction to comics. I mean, I was an 80s kid, but my parents came home with a big box full of uh, Silver Age books that the covers ripped off they got from a used bookstore. Right. So my introduction to comics was Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen, Superman's girlfriend Lois Lane, uh, the old 70s Supergirl comics where right. they had like the reader submissions for costume redesigns yeah. in the back. Oh, it was so good. And, yeah. then, all, and then all the Julie Schwartz stuff fr from the... From the silver, you know the, I mean beyond Superman, you go to Green Lantern and the Flash and the Atom and Hawkman and and boy, those were just, and you know Julie might get might get branded as one of those who only does the clever story, but he really understood those characters, mm. and he really was careful when I was writing for him to say, you've got to you know a a Superboy story can't be a story that would happen to Superman. You know, he's, a di he's in a different place in life. So, so Julie really understood who those characters were and the stories that really worked in those characters' lives. And that's, that's really important. So, mm. yeah. Well, cool. Well, uh, the, all those things are collected in showcase editions now, or a yeah, lot of it is. A lot of it is. And, and one that is also collected in the showcase editions that I know you're not going to say, but I'll say it, okay. is Amethyst Princess of Gem World, which for years, I had every convention I went to, I would grab it from the back issue bins, like the 50 cent bins, whenever, like grab as many copies as I could. And whenever I would talk to my fellow cartoonists and I would say, you want to know how to make comics? This is how you make comics. And I would put those books in front of them. You've heard me talk endlessly about this. We did a workshop together, yeah, actually, yeah. where I was pointing to a page where I was like, look at what Michigan, Cone, and Cologne did here that only comics can do. And then I got to watch you go, oh, that's nice. I'm glad I did that. <laughs> yeah, yeah well, it, it, it's, it's, it's really very cool. But I'm, I'm very pleased to have amethyst uh collected in in one of the showcase editions it's in black and white which is kind of that's bad. kind of a bummer but man. you know it it's uh it's well put together uh it only includes the issues that gary and i wrote rather than some of the later stuff by other writers mm -hmm. so i'm happy about that i'm happiest about the 12 issue maxi series uh, mm -hmm. i tell people just to read that part of the collection because that's what i'm really proud of and gosh that ernie cologne is one heck of an artist it you, oh that that particular book is some of the finest comics of the 20th century, in my opinion. Oh, thank you. I mean, and I and I, I say that partially because I grew up with it, but I mean, I know that there's nostalgia in there, but also in retrospect, going back and picking it apart and looking at what you guys put together there, it, it, what you intuited, right? I'm sure part yeah. of it was was up here in the frontal cortex stuff, yeah. but a lot of it, like as I pointed it out to you, like look what you guys did here, and you're like, oh yeah, I guess in retrospect we were onto something. But yeah, yeah, but I was, you know, I reread when the when the showcase edition came out, I I reread the book and I went. Well, and it's okay. And <laughs> and talking about characters who we believe in and care about, mm -hmm. and who are making difficult choices. Taffy, Amy's yeah. dog, right. is ranks among like probably like the top thirty DC heroes in my opinion. The part <laughs> when Taffy goes back to save Amy and takes over a wolf pack. 
Yeah. Oh my gosh, that's just chilling, and it's just goosebump inducing. It, it it really is one of the finest. I I recommend anybody who loves comics needs to read that series. I don't just say that because actually the reason I'm saying that is the reason that Dan and I became friends in the first place. Right. Because I did not know him before uh, I I was telling everybody about that. So anyway, he started drooling on the floor talking about Amethyst, and I said, <laughs> I think I like this guy. <laughs> This kid's all right. Yeah. All right. Well, then we got to let Aaron Helmrich in here. So, Dan Mishkin, thank you for being on the show. Oh, you don't have to grab that. Uh, I got it. Uh, but uh, where can we find you? DanMishkin.com. DanMishkin.com, Facebook.com slash Dan Mishkin. Uh, I, I think I have a Tumblr, but I haven't done anything with it. <laughs> you know, we gotta, it's hard to get used to this stuff. And Kids anyway, Read Comics. Kids Read Comics. KidsReadComics.org is where there's a bunch of, bunch of information about this fantastic free event that we are, uh, we are making happen on June 22nd and 23rd right here at the Ann Arbor District Library. It is a lot of fun. It, we tell our guests, as I said, it's an opportunity to change kids' lives, mm -hmm. kids, teens, parents, it's an opportunity to have your life changed and enriched. That's what comics do. That's right, and it's totally free. Yeah. June 21st, 22nd, and 23rd. we got a special evening thing going on on the 21st, but go to kidsreadcomics.org to find out more about it. We work really hard on the show every year. Yeah. And, uh, and we got guests like Ben Hatke, Raina Telgemeier, Dave Roman, Rafael Rosado. we got a really good... It's going to be darn good. We might even get Dean Tripp up here sometime. It's possible. <laughs> that would be nice. That would be awesome. I'd go for that. All right, well, thank you again, Dan. So you I'm going to switch out with Aaron while I turn to Dean okay. and say, Dean, do you have any books that you would recommend, definitive superhero comics that people who well, are intrigued? We mentioned it a minute ago, but tag, tagging on uh, what Dan was talking about earlier about, uh, you know, your place in the world and, and trying to find out what to do with, you know, your adult power. Um, what I recommend to people is because a lot of people say they can't relate to Superman. And uh, so I like to give them two books as a bookend, two 12-issue series, and it's Superman Birthright and All-Star Superman. Mm. And I, I think uh, for a lot of fans my age and older uh, don't really, didn't really get into Birthright, but I think that is an excellent Superman origin story. I think Wade killed it. I think that there's a closing scene in that book that it belongs in every Superman origin story, and you can't have it without it after that book. And... Uh, you know, people talk about Superman not being able to be related to, but we all exploded out of space as tiny particles, and here we are on Earth, and we don't know how we got here, and uh, let's figure out what to do. And Superman's very relatable in that. And, I, you know, I would recommend a Batman story, but there's, you should just read all of that. Yeah, that's something we didn't get to. I'm going to have to beg you to come back for another time because one of the things that I, I think is interesting about Batman is how malleable he is, and you can do Elseworlds. You can do Brave and the Bold. You can do Batman animated series. You can do The Batman, and it all works. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. And and so like when people get really hung up on... You can do on, Batman and Robin with George Clooney and giant <laughs> you know super puns the whole time, and it still kind of works. Yeah, yeah, you're right. So, uh, okay, cool. Well, then... Uh, Read every Batman story. That's the yeah, book. That's all. Just read, read all of them. <laughs> all right. So real quick, I'm going to turn to Erin Helmrich of the Ann Arbor As I say her name, the microphone flops down on the floor. Erin Helmrich of the Ann Arbor District Library, comics.aadl.org. Are you just going to hold the mic? I think so. I can try it. Well, now I'm going to wreck mine. Oh, Matt Dubay didn't set these up right. Let's see if I can... I'm not sure you could blame me for Aaron touching the microphone. Uh, here we go. I, it's it's this knob here that that tightens it. So. Thank you. But anyway, so. Um, well, in ca I have to say, in case anyone was wondering, I live my life as strawberry shortcake day in and day out. Making because, those choices. Well, because then every day can be a very good day. <laughs> <laughs> ah, still love. I I actually recorded an episode of the Saturday Supercast with Dave Roman and. And uh, I want to say it was Sean Robert on there with us where we talked about uh, our love of strawberry shortcake. And it was like a full hour talking about girls' cartoons. We talked about My Little Pony, Strawberry Shortcake, and Kim Possible, actually. Mm -hmm. So I'll put that in well, the show notes. I still have my entire strawberry shortcake collection that someday I may sell on eBay. We'll see. Oh, don't do it. Don't do it. Do you even have the miniatures? I do. Oh. I even have, yeah, I have a ridiculous. I thing. never got raspberry, uh, raspberry tart. Yes. That, that, was the, that was the one I was coveting. I have her. She has curly hair. Yeah, yeah. And I forget what animal she came with uh, later on, because they started coming with animals yes. later. But anyway, we could take... I didn't get any of the, um, uh, I didn't have any of the evil, the <laughs> evil guys. What's that, You were real. <laughs> for real fan. Yeah. 
Uh, lime chiffon was my second favorite, and I did get her one uh, Christmas, and that was a good Christmas. Apple I think dumpling and, and apricot, whatever her name was, were mine. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, but anyway, so we got book recommendations. Yes. <laughs> so my first book is Chicken Hair because half chicken, half rabbit, 100% hero. Um, mm. It's awesome. It's about a chicken hare whose best friend is a turtle, and he meets up with a couple of other folks, and then there's an evil taxidermist after him and his buddies to oh, make them wow. into stuffed animals. I've not heard of this. Here we go. How's that? So there. Okay. I've not heard of this. Yeah, and Chris this is Grind. the first one. I think there's a couple sequels that we also have on order. Okay. Um, but yeah, I just love anything with an evil taxidermist. <laughs> it very That's often. A, it's like sold. I'm yeah. I'm in. Uh, okay. Oh, I love the art. Yeah. So this is kind of like like uh, vaguely Jeff Smith ish. Yeah. Uh, no. Definitely. Oh, and there's a, there's a pull quote in the back by Jeff Smith. Yeah. Funny, witty characters with sharp drawings bring chicken hair to my life. A mysterious and whimsical adventure from Scholastic. Yes. Awesome. So this is in the collection yep. now. And then the first volume of Merman, which is actually kind of hilarious. It's um, Joey Weiser. about a little merman who escapes from the ocean and is left behind a lot of trouble in Mer. And so he makes friends and is trying to get acclimated to the normal school world. And the Mer troubles come and follow him. Now this That's book. my friend Joey's book. Joey Weiser, uh, Oni Press. It's like 20 minutes from me. Oh, really? Yeah, he's awesome. His, his art is awesome. I uh, know. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun. It does look like a lot of fun. I've not read this one either, so I will have to check this one out. Is this in the collection now? Yes, or is it? Okay. They're, they're both just uh, waiting to be processed. <laughs> um, and then last two are just a couple of good, um, you know, funny, very quick ones. Everyone liked Vader and Son, so now we have Vader's Little Princess. Um, which is equally as hilarious with my favorite page, and I'll have Jersey hold that up. Yeah. Um, with Leia being really embarrassed when Dad drops her off at school in, in an at at. Oh, I'm gonna hold it up here so you can actually get a close up, Matt. <laughs> and she's so embarrassed. The rest of the kids are all staring at Dad's vehicle. <laughs> this is this is Jeffrey Brown yes. of the Incredible Change Bots, and uh, yeah, what was the first one called? Vader knows best. I think it was just Vader and Son. Vader and Son. Yeah. Okay. So this has got all the teen angst and, you know, Leia going through, you know, all of her growing pains. And then the last one, I still really love the oatmeal. Mm -hmm. And he recently had one on how to tell if your cat is plotting to kill you. So now this one's for the dogs. Um, I have one page marked in there. Um, he does hilarious side to side. You know, my dog is not afraid of any of this, but my dog is terrified of that. Oh, here, let me get so that. So the one page I marked is... Uh, the dog being really bad at helping him pick up the ladies um, because the dog does not like slag buckets, as the dog calls him. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's it's a sh another short one, but it's a lot of fun. Oh, the oatmeal is always great, too. Yeah. yeah. So, cool. And all of these are in the collection. You can find yes. them by clicking the yep. catalog link at ADL.org. Place hold on them as we speak. And if, if something's not in the collection, we should mention every once in a while, Absolutely. there's this thing called interlibrary loan that never gets mentioned on yep. TV when people talk about libraries. Like, hello. Absolutely. You know? And if we can buy it, we'll buy it. So, you know, as long as it's still in print, let us know. And I'm at the end of my fiscal year, but I have a new one coming up July 1. And you are um, on the Twitters. I am. I actually tweeted for the first time in a year. <laughs> um, so there's actually something to follow again at Gory Girl on Twitter. Gory Girl, as in uh, Edward, Edward Gory. Gory. So yes. and, and not like you're into the zombie no. romance no. stories. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, uh, but yes, you're the central selector for yes. the graphic novels at yes. the library. So you're the person to talk to. Absolutely. And we so. buy pretty much, I buy everything that anyone suggests. So keep them coming if you don't see what you're looking for. Very cool. All right, well, thank you, Aaron Humbrick. Oh, we should also make a note, mention there is an event coming up uh, besides Kids Read Comics, which is June 21, 22, 23. Sunday, June 2nd, 1 to 3 p.m., the Comics Artist Forum at the Ann Arbor District Library. Joe Fu is coming to be our guest speaker. He's going to do a dr uh, drawing demo, uh, the drawing instruction, and then usually it's followed by just like an hour of socializing with local cartoonists in the area. It's a lot of fun. It's on the fourth floor at the downtown uh, Ann Arbor District Library. You can find information at comics.aadl.org. So, Dean, thank you for this great talk today. This was fun. Thank you, man. That was delightful. Oh, I'm glad. I'm glad to hear it. I, I would love to talk with you more about superheroes some other time. In the meantime, where, what's the most important place for people to look for you right now? Uh, DeanTrip.com. There's links to everything else. 
That site looks great, by the way. It Thanks, looks- man. It's flavors.me. I, it's a free service you can sign up for that aggregates all your feeds so you don't ever have to update it. It's wonderful. What? Yeah. They're geniuses. Flavors.me. Yeah, you can set up a free account. They have paid ones too, but I use a free one, and uh, I think the team there is excellent. They they wrote me the other day to say I was getting more traffic than uh, ever because of that you'll be safe here piece, yeah. and uh, just asked me what I thought about the site and stuff. They were really cool, and uh, I love that service. Cool. Uh, it is. A, it's a gorgeous looking site. And yeah, like and I saw like you have a photos link, and it just takes to your Instagram feed. I was like, right. how, how did he how did he pump that in there like that? It must be some kind of wacky feed aggregation Yahoo Pipes thing for sure. It's the simplest thing in the world. You just add your thing. I uh, I would have my Tumblr on there and other things, but uh, my parents check it sometimes. And... <laughs> <laughs> uh, true. Okay. So, uh, but but DeanTrip.com, uh, DeanTrip.tumblr.com, and then the podcast that people should check out is uh, the last, last cast. cast and Project Rooftop and Butterfly. So, Dean, thanks again. This was this was super, super fun. Uh, and thanks to Dan Mishkin of danmishkin.com, Dan Mishkin on Twitter. Thank you, Aaron Helmrich of Gory Girl on Twitter. And thank you to Matt Dubay and Tom Smith in the uh, in the control room for putting the show on every week, every week, or every two weeks, rather. Thanks to the Ann Arbor District Library for making this show happen. This will be archived at comicsaregreat.com slash CAG79. And until next time, everybody, I have been Jersey Drozd of ComicsAreGreat.com in Jersey on Twitter. Okay, bye.